Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is Trump Disqualified to Run for Office Again. You know, there's been a lot of talk in the last two or three years, um, particularly in the last two years, about uh, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, Section 3. And this was a post-Civil War uh, amendment to the Constitution, basically to ensure that uh, no one runs for office that is involved with uh, any insurrection or rebellion against the United States or aiding and comfort to the enemy. Uh, why was that part of this post-Civil War uh, addition to the Constitution? Because there were a lot of Confederates and there were concerns that uh, they would get in office and, and not work for the Union. So with me to discuss the 14th Amendment, Section 3, and how it applies to Donald Trump, uh, I have with me my co-host, Jay Fidel, and our special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton. Gentlemen, good morning. Good morning, Tim. Tim, Jay. Uh, Chuck, to you first. You know, there's been a lot of discussion regarding, um, well, first off, let me back up. Um, when the House Select Committee of, for January 6th Select Committee uh, produced a report, it was fairly specific. And a, a lot of the specifics in that report seemed to match up quite well with what provisions are required to prevent someone from running for office. Uh, again, the, the, the point is that once you've sworn an oath to the Constitution, you should be prohibited from office if you are found to be uh, involved with insurrection or rebellion against the United States. Um, what's your read on that, Chuck? Uh, and far as what's in that uh, House Select Committee report and how it does or doesn't line up with the provisions of the 14th Amendment, Section 3. Well, the House Select Committee report joins many other government organizations and statements in recognizing the January 6th events as an insurrection. So that's helpful because the standard is if the person engages in an insurrection or rebellion or gives aid or comfort to the enemy, then they're precluded. Just to remember, as far as the Confederates go, Congress, by more than two-thirds of both houses, as required by Amendment 14, Section 3, lifted the disability for Confederates to run for office in 1872. So pretty soon after the Civil War and after the and also the Ku Klux Klan Act, which provided some basis for precluding people from engaging in insurrections and rebellions and running for office has lapsed. So those two vehicles are gone. There's still a quo warranto action. There are still some state avenues, but no federal specific legislation to enable the enforcement of Section 3 of Amendment 14 has yet been passed. That's where we are. Okay. Thanks for that explanation. Very thorough. Uh, Jay, let's talk about the specifics of why people think that um, someone, a candidate in standing perhaps, or a member of Congress, um, should try to initiate um, Donald Trump from being uh, preventing from him running for 2024. Let's talk about the specifics of what... Um, the re the reasons of why uh, the 14th Amendment applies to Donald Trump? Well, <clears throat> to answer your question, you know, I don't know. Um, maybe they're all uh, traveling or fighting a forest fire. Um, maybe they just don't have time. But there are 1.3 million lawyers in this country. And if you if you assume that about half of them are in one bubble and the other half are in the other bubble, I do not know if that's a good assumption. But let's assume for this discussion it's about half half. That means um, you know something over uh, six hundred thousand lawyers uh, would be you know sympathetic to having Trump disqualified under Section Three. Um, but Naria one. Um, have actually advanced a case. And I think, um, you know, it, it could be, as you suggested in your opening, that the Constitution it, it doesn't provide a, a pass, and Congress hasn't acted. Um, so what is the past? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled that 
there's no path in the Constitution. A lot of people must be. And I'm troubled that not only has Congress not adopted any legislation that would allow a path, but it's very unlikely that Congress right now would adopt any legislation like that. But well, I suggest to you there is a path. And if you're nice to me, I'll tell you what the path is. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> Please continue. Uh, oh, okay. The Constitution doesn't say that somebody has to be found guilty. It doesn't say there has to be a, a civil or criminal action against this individual. It has to be indicted or tried in front of a jury or convicted um, or, or punished, um, you know, and um, uh, there, there is nothing in the Constitution about that. So where does that leave us? It's a vacuum. But it seems to me that a vacuum is, is filled here by, by one single act, and that is an act by a person with standing, and we can discuss what standing would be, in a federal district court where the district court finds, as a matter of fact, that the requirements of Section 3 have been met. That's all. Um, it doesn't have to be any criminal action. So I want to read it to you. No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress uh, or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, mm, uh, under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature or as an executive or judicial officer of any state, support the Constitution of the United States, shall, this is the operative language, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, meaning the United States, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof, meaning the United States. But Congress may, and this is interesting, we should talk about it, but Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each house, remove that disability. There's nothing in there about, you know, a, a criminal proceeding or a, a finding in a criminal context. Um, and there's, there's, you know, no action has been taken to provide judicial gloss on that. Case in New Mexico really doesn't help us very much. But if you went to a federal judge and say, I move, special proceeding, right? What, what's the section of the federal rules? In fact, there's a section of the a, um, a certain kind of proceeding in the federal court. Um, it's full war until. And there's another one, too, uh, under the federal rules. Um, asking for the judge to determine disqualification, and the judge says, you know, you're right. He should be disqualified. End of story. Uh, no jury, no nothing. Happens on one day. Okay. And then, of course, the, uh, the, the appellate practice begins. But it seems to me if the person who made that motion had standing, we should talk about that, then that would be sufficient um, to disqualify an individual uh, under Section 3. Comments, Chuck? Well, why not? Because we've seen that at least a number of times in history that the full warrant or federal process and several state processes have been used to invoke Article Section 3, Amendment 14, disqualification of people, county commissioners and, and others. And in fact, in several cases, at least two representatives, uh, one back in the 19th century and then Bergen, I think, in 1919. Um, so it's it's been done, but so rare and so few and far between that there's very little precedent for it. And it's it's extremely politically unpopular. It's difficult. It's challenging. We can go down the specifics of why we think Donald Trump is subject to the uh, 14th uh, Section 3. We can go through all those things that uh, he performed or was involved with, what we what we think we he has. It's, it's all alleged at this point because it hasn't uh, gone to trial. Um, wait, but wait. A... Before, before you just gloss over that, let me tell you what the article in the crew publication said. And you can tell me that this has not been proved. Okay, 
Trump spread false claims of a stolen election. I don't think there's any question. Trump's lie is number two. Trump's lie that the election was stolen, uh, and he propelled Stop the Steal movement. Um, I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, he tried to exert pressure on Pence and Congress to unlawfully refuse to certify the result on January 6th. May 3rd, Trump personally led an effort to pressure, coerce, and intimidate government officials, including Pence, to help him overturn the election results. I don't think there's any question. And, and, you know, and, and Jackson well, don't forget Georgia looking for 11,780 votes. Uh, let's not forget the, his summon of the crowd. Let's not forget his words to incite the crowd. And let's not forget his inaction to quell the crowd. So I, right, there's, right. there's more. There's more. Um, <laughs> once the mob was assembled on January 6th, he incited them to, quote, fight like hell to overturn the election result and stop the steal. Next one. After learning the Capitol was under attack, he poured fuel on the fire, targeting Pence for lacking the courage to overturn the election. In a tweet that measurably caused, caused the mob to surge, Next, Trump failed to act for three hours as his mob ransacked the Capitol, brutally assaulted police officers, and called for the murder of elected officials. He failed to deploy, deploy a federal response. Uh, I could go on. Let me last okay. one. Well, those are, those are all great points. And instead of intervening to defend the Capitol, he actually tried to enlist members of Congress to deliver on the mob's goal to delay the certification. So and that's just, it's a broad brush, but I don't okay. think there's really any question that those things took place. Okay, great point. Let me, let me parlay that into a question here. And that is, there's, you know, the criticism about using the 14th Amendment is that you're presuming guilt prior to conviction. But uh, isn't it true that we're not, this is not a criminal um, section. It's, no one's saying that there's a criminal thing that he would have to pay a price for. It's just a qualification of office. Uh, what's wrong with that? Anything? Well, let me say that if Jack Smith has his way and gets his indictment and has a trial and convicts Trump for insurrection, is you know if that's a that's but he's not going after pretty. insurrection, right? Uh, what is the primary difference between trying to prevent Congress from doing their duty for the peaceful transfer of power yeah. from one president to the other versus? Um, how, how do you know about he's not going after an insurrection? Well, we don't. We don't yet. So but, I, it's very likely he may be doing that. Let's assume for my answer that he gets an indictment and a prosecution and a conviction for participating in an insurrection. All the things I just read to you. There's no question then, right? The constitutional requirements are met in a criminal proceeding. But the question here among us is whether they can be met without a criminal conviction. And my view of it is they can. Yeah. Uh, Chuck, what is the difference between insurrection versus um, an individual involved with trying to prevent the peaceful transfer of power from one president to the other and, and basically obstructing Congress from doing its business? Yeah, that's a great question, Tim, because that is, in fact, the distinction that I, I think Jay makes a good point is a distinction without a difference as far as Trump is concerned between the obstruction uh, of the enforcement of the electoral results and the insurrection to try and accomplish that obstruction by force and violence. There's, there's no real separation. And the list that Jay went through combines those two as if there is no distinction because in Trump's mind and in his actions, there isn't any. If you look at the Mar-a-Lago documents in there, 37 different charges in there. The likelihood that Jack Smith is going to come out with a large number of charges in the indictment on the January 6th events is equally great. Is there in that combination of charges a combination that would make the jump from obstruction to insurrection? I think Jay's right. I think that's likely. I think that's exactly where Jack Smith yeah. is in. Um, let's go to well, Jay. Let me, let, me, let me answer that. You know, the thing about how, um, you know, this was a peaceful, that's 
completely poppycock. Um, the thing about how this is, this is not an insurrection. That's poppycock too, because these people wanted to reject the will of the voters. Uh, they wanted to reject the whole system. They wanted to, you know, reject the way we conduct our democracy under the Constitution. They wanted a new way of doing it. They wanted to overthrow the government. The government had elected Biden. They wanted to overthrow the whole enchilada. I mean, put me on that jury or put me on the, you know, the bench. I'll, I'll find that in 10 seconds, maybe five. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> Okay, Chuck, uh, let's go to Jay's point about standing, what that means, and why it's important for anyone to pursue the 14th Amendment, Section 3. You no, know, 14th Amendment, Section 3, does not, it, like many other statutes, establish a standing requirement. It's really the focus on the actor and whether they engaged in insurrection or rebellion or gave aid or comfort to the enemy, which could be the insurrection. So any state could do it. A citizen of a state could do it. A citizen of the US could do it. You're not gonna run into the same kind of standing problems that you do when you have civil rights actions and things like that, where you have to demonstrate that you have a specific case in controversy and an identifiable particular individual injury or harm. You don't have to show that here. That's not a prerequisite. Okay. The focus is on whether the person who is the subject of the proceeding did in fact engage in insurrection or rebellion or did in fact provide aid or comfort to the enemy. Yeah, it's very interesting. Right. Usually we talk about criminal statutes, we talk about the elements of the offense, right? right. And right. and there's no there's no specificity, there's no list of elements here. All you have to do to be disqualified is engage. You don't have to plan it. You don't have to be the, um, the leader of it. You don't even have to go through all those points I read out of the crew article. All you have to do is engage and um, be there. And, um, you know, I, I suggest that, that the Constitution, the founders are telling us, it's not a crime, it's just a connection. That's all it okay, is. Okay, well, if, if the bar is far lower than approving criminal uh, points, uh, why hasn't anyone, either Democrat or like a Chris Christie, uh, why haven't they gone to federal court and say, hey, I'd like to file this complaint? You know, are they waiting? It, are they waiting for an indictment from Jack Smith? Uh, what more do they need other than I, I think the um, the select committee's report? That's their brief. Well, I'd like to. Can I answer that? Or yeah, Chuck, you want to answer? That? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Jay. If we think there might be an indictment from Jack Smith, okay, then we are reluctant to actually go down this path because then we have like competing proceedings, okay, uh, around the involvement in the insurrection. And it it, it actually, I think it, um, it's not a good thing to have competing proceedings. Um, if, he, if he beats one, then that's an argument that he should beat the other. Um, well, or, or, if one, or if one is um, successful, um, how does that affect the other? So it could be, I'm not saying this right. I'm only saying that those right, who but might- let, let me ask you this. I mean, Jack Smith is a criminal proceeding, whereas the 14th uh, Amendment, third Section 3, is just a qualifi qualification for the office. So it's a, it prevents anyone from entering the office. That's not criminal-based. So what's the harm in competing uh, actions? Well, I'll give you a, a, a – I mean, I'm just – we're just speculating here, but mm -hmm. I'll give you a scenario. <clears throat> Let's assume they're both working. Let's assume somebody goes to the federal district court and um, the federal uh, district courts, the judge says, uh, could be a judge that is sympathetic, you know, to Trump, because a lot of them were appointed by him. Um, and the judge says, uh, you know, I'm not inclined to do this for A, B, C, and D, whatever those reasons might be. Um, we could cook them up if you want. Um, so I'm not doing it. Okay, now Trump comes in. And he capitalizes on everything, doesn't he? 
And Trump says, well, they try to get me in a civil proceeding or in a non, you know, a non-criminal proceeding, and they couldn't. And and see, this is all a witch hunt, and see, I'm really innocent in the criminal proceeding. So I can see him using that and confusing or trying to confuse the public about it. Having him at the same time, you know, some people might feel not a great mm-hmm. idea. Okay. There's another thing, another thing too, I wanted to finish answering your question. I've been thinking about this because, you know, the question is a really good question. Why doesn't somebody get up there? Say, Chuck, let's let's make it Chuck for now. If Chuck filed this action here in the United States District Court, uh, and he had a client who had standing, we have to cover that, um, then um, he would be the number one target of Trump in the country at that moment. Number one. And uh, Chuck might have a little concern about that. He might be a little reserved about standing up and being the number one target for Trump and all his base who you cannot necessarily connect with Trump, but who might do bad things. So all I'm saying is that there's a fear factor. Mm. And uh, a lot of people who might do this uh, don't want to be out there by themselves. I suppose if it was a firm, you know, and, um, you know, you, you couldn't identify one person so quickly, uh, then that might be a little safer for the lawyer who represents the person bringing the action. Well, I think what you're suggesting is why half of Congress won't stand up to Trump. There's a fear factor. Yeah. And that's unfortunate because um, they've allowed this guy to grow from a monster to a huge monster. Uh, Chuck, um, do, you, do you think that competing um, efforts to get, uh, prevent Trump from office at the same time being uh, indicted, um, do you buy that? Um, what about all the other indictments that are coming down the pathway? And will those be competing as well? No, I think Jay makes a good point. And I think the fear factor that's an extremely strong disincentive for people on an individual level to get involved in this, or even groups of identifiable in individuals to get involved in this, because there's literally no limit on the lengths to which Trump urges people to go. Don't forget, not much more than a week ago, when asked about whether something like this might be in the cards if the indictments continue to come down, he said repeatedly, that would be very dangerous. If anybody were to consider something like that, I think that would be very dangerous. That's as about overt a threat, I think, as you get from somebody Mm -hmm. who has armed followers. The other point out of all those great points that Jay alluded to was that Trump knew his followers were armed when they stormed the Capitol. And in fact, encouraged that. It was brought to his attention to take action, and he declined with specifically that awareness. Yeah, he said something like, they're not after me, uh, so remove the magnetometers from the uh, White House, you know, because uh, um, he knew they had arms. So let's talk about standing, Tim, Chuck. Uh, who could go there? Um, could Chuck go there representing you? No, I, I think it'd have to be a candidate for running for president of the United States. So if, if there's a candidate, no, go ahead. No, the past cases have never had opposing candidates bringing those, those claims. States can bring them. Uh, there's no reason you can see from the statute or from the amendment itself that Individual citizens could not bring those claims. Um, I'd be worried about that because if you had somebody who had imperfect standing, you could go through the whole procedure and then find the thing turned upside down. You wasted your time. Correct. So you, at least you have to have an argument that um, there, you know, there is good standing. I, I, I think you're right about state states that a state would have standing. An election official, you know, uh, would have standing. A secretary of state certainly would have standing in a given state. You know, <clears throat> judge, I don't know what to do. I don't know mm-hmm. right, who to put on the ballot. 
I need your advice on that. Um, and, 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 a, and a judge would, you know, be sympathetic to that from a procedural and standing point of view. But I think if it was any of the three of us, um, I think that's, that's got a fatal flaw in it, only because such, such an easy appeal point. And when you get it turned over, what do you got? Nothing. So, you know, it, it's, uh, it may not be in the Constitution. It may not be in the, you know, the case law to date. But you got to have some claim of standing where you're going to be exposed. Well, it'll be interesting to see who tried to, uh, who had standing to <laughs> oust Francis Matthews of Otero County C Commissioner in New Mexico. Uh, who was successful at withstanding to have him removed from that position? And I don't know the answer to that, to be honest with you. No, I mean, it's New Mexico. It's a case that was turned over anyway. It doesn't mean anything. It's right now, uh, short of a, a further appeal, I'm not sure that's going to happen. Um, it's not really precedent for this. And where is New Mexico anyway? Sorry. Sorry I said that. Um, <laughs> you might have to take that out of the program. <laughs> uh, Jay, how does the country react if someone was successful of preventing Donald Trump from entering office again? Think of all the different factions, uh, the MAGA GOP, just the regular GOP, Democrats, independents, um, people that don't care about politics. Uh, how would the country react? Well, you're, you're really asking a question of timing, you know. And um, I, I think it's really interesting, that question, because here we are, we're, you know, a year and a, a few months away from Election Day. Um, if this doesn't if this case isn't brought early enough, um, you know, it's hard to say how it's going to affect anything. Uh, and I think as you get closer to election day, it gets more difficult for a judge to actually make a decision. You know, Chuck, I don't want to tell you anything you don't know, but sometimes, sometimes judges sit on cases until, mm -hmm. until the cows come home. Uh, they may wait years to actually render a decision. So if you don't file right now, my opinion, you aren't going to get a timely decision. <laughs> you stand a good chance of not getting a timely decision. Furthermore, um, as so, with so many things these days, it's really a question of what kind of, what <laughs> kind of media information, what kind of messaging you put out on the media how well informed is the public about this case? Because in the end, it's the public, it's the media that will have a lot of say about what happens here and how they should react. Um, I would say, of course, you're going to get witch hunt. You're going to get the, something wrong with the judge, uh, something wrong, I don't know, something wrong. And there'll be a big fight in the media. So we really have to um, prepare for that. Uh, and you have to do it soon enough so that you get a, what do you want to call it, a public opinion result, a polling result, a media result. Uh, at the last minute, it's just going to be, I think, too late. Thank you, Jay. Hey, Chuck, um, what about, let me ask you a question about the counter argument that uh, pursuing uh, the 14th Amendment, Section 3, through a court um, really should be left up to voters instead. What do you think about that counter argument? Well, the amendment in the section wouldn't be there if it were intended to be left to the voters. It's not a legislative decision. It's a legal qualification for office that the Congress has enacted as a constitutional amendment with sufficient approval by the states for it to become effective. But I think Jay's right. The timing is important, but also important the broadest possible representation and support for any action to apply and enforce the 14th Amendment, Section 3, to a Trump candidacy. You remember there's a, there's a bit of a pushback going on. There was an article in the Times about uh, people in, I want to say, Iowa, Republicans who raised a million and a half dollars to um, fight Trump, fight him off the ballot. Um, because he had too much political baggage. They don't want the MAGA Republicans running things. Now, that, that's only one group in one state with a million and a half dollars. It doesn't seem like that much, but maybe there's more to come. 
they don't feel he's a worthy candidate for whatever reason. I'm sure they articulated those reasons, but they don't they don't feel he's mm -hmm. worthy. And maybe there are other groups and other other groups of Republicans in other states that are going to get on that bandwagon, and that certainly changes things. But I agree with Chuck. The mm -hmm. idea is to ramp up to this and and have the public speak to it and have a lot of mm, mm, commentary in the media that, yeah, they're right. Section three applies. That would help. It would. OK, let me put um, our imaginary caps on. Uh, how would Donald Trump take advantage of any any attempts to prevent him from office? Jay? Well, I, I think he'd make, um, you know, ridiculous arguments. He would say it uh, doesn't apply. I need to be convicted. They're, they're trying to, you know, run it. They're trying to run it around the side here. They want to get me on Section 3. They have to get me convicted. That'd be the first thing. And as I mentioned, uh, there'd, be, there'd be a standing issue possibly um, in any non-criminal non proceeding. Um, and I suppose he could say, think about it. Uh, no, that, no, that wasn't me. I wasn't really there. I was just talking. I have First Amendment rights, and uh, I didn't. I didn't do anything wrong here. It was the crowd, not me. And the crowd were a peaceful communion of people who were just concerned about the election. Uh, course, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't hold up very well when you have evidence of the fact that he knew the election wasn't stolen. You know. Yeah, I think. Jay, by inference, has alluded to what might be the most important point. If it's going to be done, and it needs to be done soon, and it needs to be done by as broad a representative group and as well supported and broadly supported a group as possible, the focus needs to be on this is a congressionally enacted qualification for holding office, like age or anything else. That's all it is. It's not a criminal statute. But it is a disqualifying element. It doesn't need to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. It doesn't need to show that the person who brings the claim would be harmed if it's not enforced. None of that stuff. The question is, does this person fall within this disqualification or not? It's a congressional disqualification. Enforce it as such. You know, that, that opens a, a whole new line of possibility. Does it have to be a federal judge? Or can it simply be an election official? This is, you know, from my bedtime reading, I've been reading Section 3, and I'm afraid that I cannot put Donald Trump um, on, the, on the ballot because he, he was involved, engaged in an, uh, an insurrection. So I'm not putting him on there. And that happens in, say, Georgia, um, Maryland, New York, Illinois, California. And then, and then you have a real interesting election, don't you? Because Trump would not be on the ballot by virtue of the election officials in all those states. And they made their own minds up by reading the language, the English language, in the Constitution. What do you say about that? So the Constitution does not say you have to go to court at all. It could be somebody reading it and making a decision based on what it says. Who? You heard it here on Think Tank. Well, consider this show as the um, the opening salvo for that. You bet. <laughs> all right. Uh, Jay, your last thoughts. Um, all good discussion here today. Your last thoughts. I'm really tired of hearing everybody read and write about this, and nobody actually takes, takes um, you know, the matter in hand. Um, I am hoping that the Bar Association, somebody in the Bar Association, and as I mentioned a minute ago, somebody, uh, some official in some state, and maybe other states to follow, if the Republicans in Iowa can, you know, put them off the ballot, um, why doesn't the Secretary of State in Iowa put them off the ballot? And a, a lot of states, you know, it wouldn't take that many battleground states to ruin the election for Trump. Think about it. You, you could disqualify him in battleground states. End of story. Um, and, of course, he would appeal. And, of course, you would say, you don't need to appeal. All you do is go to Congress and get a two-thirds vote, and you can be excused from your disqualification. That's how you appeal. <laughs> it, would be uh, very, it would put the whole burden on him. 
Sounds like a sound solution to me, and I like the 50-state approach. All right. Thank you. Uh, we've run out of time, and I'd like to thank my co-host, Jay Fidel, and my special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton, for a very great discussion and some great ideas presented out there about where we go from here. And so why don't you join us next week for American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And until then, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.